God's providence, the plan of God, God's hand in creation and God's hand in history is unfolding right now in your life and in mine. The plan of God, it's really unstoppable in a sense. God's will, God's will will come about. Now, when we think about God's will, and I mentioned at the beginning of Mass, you know, Officer Brandon Estorf and Sergeant Stephen Robin, and, you know, we think about God's will, and it's, it's troubling, isn't it? it? It makes us, it reduces us kind of down to the most fundamental questions about justice and fairness and life and death. You know, when something like that happens either in our community or in our own personal life. And we ask about God's will. And so we in the church understand that God has his permissive will. And the permissive will is, of God is that he allows things to happen. For example, God allows sinful, happen, sinful things to happen even though he does not desire it. Why does God allow sinful things to happen? That is where we enter into the mystery of the cross. That's where we really have to kind of humble ourselves to the mystery of that sometimes we don't have all the answers and we are called to a place of prayer. God truly loves us and love necessarily implies freedom. And God lovingly allows us to freely choose him or reject him. When God, when we reject, when men and women reject the will of God, then we sin. And God permits such things. I'm going to quote the catechism here, the teaching of the church, the compendium of the doctrines of the faith. Angels and men, as intelligent and free creatures, have to, we have to, by our own choice, journey toward our ultimate destiny by free choice and by preferential love. We can go astray. Indeed, we have sinned. And thus evil, and which is much more evil, has entered into the world. God in no way, directly or indirectly, causes it, but he permits it. And this is one of the most challenging truths, but it's also a beautiful truth that God in his goodness and in his power can bring good out of evil. And that is the challenge of us in living a life of faith. In all things, we think about the gospel even that I proclaimed a moment ago, all things are only understood ultimately through the cross. Through the cross. In the book of Revelation, there is a liturgy in heaven and the curtain is pulled back and the apostle John can see into heaven. And when he looks into heaven, what does he see? He sees a lamb on a throne that appears to have been slain. And the lamb on the throne that appears to have been slain is Christ on his cross. And it is the cross through which we understand history. It is the cross through which we understand the world. It is the cross through which we understand the providence of God unfolding. And let me tell you, it's a mystery bigger than me. I want to do God's will in my life. I want you to do God's will in my life. And the more perfectly we do God's will in our lives, the less, the less evil there will be. And God wants us, and I'm going to quote the Bible, God our Savior wills all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That is God's will. But guess what? We have the freedom not to do God's will. And that is all too evident in this world, isn't it? And so we live in this time. Recently, I was standing in a country of, a, of 80 million people a country of 80 million people, less than 1% of them are baptized. It was once a center of Christianity. It was the center of the Byzantine Empire. And now it has collapsed and the faith is all but gone. And I wonder how and why. And I ask these questions about salvation and 
and God's providence and God's power and God's peace. And you know, I come back to the reality that it's bigger than me. But I do know this and I believe this, that God's plan is unfolding right now in your life and in mine. And we have a part to play. And that part that we have to play is not insignificant, particularly for our own well-being. We have a huge part to play in the unfolding providence of God. Now, this gospel and the readings today are a contrast between two men. We have Ahaz, who was the key figure in the first reading, and we have Joseph. And we have a contrast between those two as their embrace of God's providence or their rejection of God's providence. So how much backstory do you want on King Ahaz? I have a lot. I don't know how much I could go on and on, but I got a lot of backstory on Ahaz, but I'll give you a little. So Ahaz is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. You know that long reading where so-and-so begot so-and-so and, and Uzziah begot Jotham and Jotham begot Ahaz and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. And if you keep going down the line, sooner or later you get to Jesus. So Ahaz is the father of Hezekiah and he's also in the lineage of Jesus. He was the king. He was the king of the southern portion of, uh, of the nation. Israel had split into the north and into the south. You had Israel in the north and you had Judah in the south. And Ahaz was the king of Judah. And he had power and he had authority and he had position and he had money. And he had a prophet named Isaiah. And the southern kingdom was being threatened and Ahaz was challenged to put his faith in God. And Ahaz, and this was the first reading that we heard a moment ago, Isaiah challenges him to trust in God, even to the point of saying, ask for a sign. But Ahaz does not trust, and he even lies to the prophet to his face. He shows his lack of faith. He shows his lack of trust. He shows his lack of, of uh, honor and his lack of integrity. He's afraid. He's afraid of losing his power. He's afraid of suffering. He's afraid of humiliation and defeat and failure. And these are all natural things to be afraid of, aren't they? And so in his fear, what did he do? He turned not to God, but he turned to worldly power and things. And he put his trust in making an alliance with an evil king. He is, Ahaz is, for the people like Joseph and Mary and, and Zechariah and Elizabeth and all those characters in the New Testament, Ahaz would have been the picture of infidelity. They would have known about Ahaz. If you were called Ahaz, that would have been an insult to you. That would have been called like being called Benedict Arnold. Ahaz was a, a horrible king. He even turned at one point in his life after he had been defeated, as Isaiah said, he would be defeated. After he was defeated, he turned and gave his allegiance to the pagan gods and even sacrificed his own children to these pagan gods. That's Ahaz. Ahaz was given a glimpse of God's providence and God's prophecy, and he turned his back on God. And what did it say? It goes like this. I'm going to read you that first reading. The Lord spoke to Ahaz saying, ask for a sign from the Lord your God. Let it be deep as the netherworld or high as the sky. And Ahaz answered, I will not ask. I will not tempt the Lord. Lying in his faithlessness. Then Isaiah said, listen, O house of David, is it not enough for you to weary people? Must you also weary my God with your lies, with your infidelity, with your du duplicity and two-faced? So he said, therefore, this is the Isaiah speaking to him, therefore the Lord himself will give you this sign. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and you shall name him Emmanuel. Well, this is eight hundred years before Christ. You say, well, that prophecy is not going to do him a lot of good. It's not going to be fulfilled for 800 more years. 
Well, no, that's where we have to understand the Bible a little more than on one single layer. There are multiple fulfillments of prophecy. We have what we call the provisional fulfillments of prophecy, and then we have the perfect fulfillment of prophecy. And so the provisional fulfillment of prophecy is Ahaz's own son, one of his sons that he didn't kill, named Hezekiah. And when Isaiah made this prophecy, undoubtedly Hezekiah's mother was still a virgin, but Hezekiah's mother was going to give birth to Hezekiah, and Hezekiah was going to be a good king, and he was going to reestablish Judah in fidelity to God and good government and order and all of those things. And the prophet Isaiah is saying, don't be afraid. Your own son is going to sit on the throne. You're going to have trust in God. But Ahaz doesn't do it. So we had the provisional fulfillment of that prophecy in the birth of Hezekiah. And now we are going to see that very same prophecy come up again. Now, do you think Joseph was familiar with Ahaz? Of course he was. Do you think Joseph was familiar with this prophecy? Of course he was, because he understood the scriptures. He was a righteous man. And so we have the angel come to him. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her, and she will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will take, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what had, the Lord had spoken through the prophet. And what did the Lord speak through the prophet? Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel. And this is the perfect fulfillment of that prophecy happening. Ultimately, God's plan will come to pass. God has a plan, and it is unfolding. And it's unfolding in our life right now. And you know what we are? We are human actors in the plan of God unfolding. And we can either be like Ahaz or we can be like Joseph. We can either embrace God's plan and the difficulties and the challenges of being faithful in that plan, or we can turn our back on that plan. But in either case, God's providence is going to be fulfilled. Isaiah saw the Lord's holiness. He confessed, I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. Isaiah was called to be a prophet. And you know what he saw? He saw that his prophecy was going to be unheeded. He saw that Ahaz was not going to pay attention to him. He saw that the Assyrians were going to defeat them. But still, Isaiah did his part, didn't he? He was faithful to his role in God's unfolding plan. I think about St. Paul's letter that we had today, this morning. St. Paul writes his letter to the Romans and how it ties into the Christmas story, how it ties into the Advent story, is that Paul speaks about Jesus being the descendant of David. Descendant of David, descendant of Hezekiah, descendant of Ahaz, descendant of Abraham. So Paul points that out. But St. Paul also recognizes God's providence working in his life. Paul is called, called to be a disciple of Christ. And when Paul is called to be a disciple of Christ, when Paul takes his place in the providence of God, is everything all of a sudden easy, no challenges, no difficulties. It all makes perfect sense now. There's no tragedies. There's no betrayal. There's no lie. There's no horrible murders. Is that what Paul's life was when he embraced the providence of God? Not at all. In fact, let me read you a little bit about Paul's life. 
I have been frequently flogged. I have been exposed to death. I have received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. I was pelted with stones. I was shipwrecked day and night in the open seas. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, danger in the country, danger at sea, danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and gone without sleep. I've been hungry and thirsty and gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And you know what? That was God's providence. And Paul embraced his role in it, didn't he? And how did Paul understand that? I have come to preach to you nothing but Christ and him crucified. See, it is the cross that brings salvation to the world. St. Augustine said this, let us understand that God is a physician, a healer. God is a physician, a doctor. God is a physician and that suffering is a medicine for our salvation, not a punishment for damnation. That in God's providence, we experience difficulties and trials, don't we? But through those difficulties and trials, we are drawn to the foot of the cross. St. Sebastian said, when it's all over, you will not regret that you have suffered, but you will regret that you have suffered so little and so badly. See, we are called in a sinful world to be part of the redemption, part of the healing. Joseph was afraid for some reason to take Mary into his home, but he was a righteous man. And he knew the prophecy of Ahaz and he knew Ahaz's faithlessness. And so when the angel Gabriel spoke to him immediately, he knew I'm going to do what? I'm going to say yes. I'm going to be faithful. Paul embraced the providence of God. Isaiah embraced the providence of God. Joseph embraced the providence of God. Providence is playing a role in your life and in my life here today. Mistakes will be made. There will be pain. There will be loss. But fear cannot control our lives. We must not be afraid. Do not be afraid. God's plan is unfolding. We can either be faithful in God's plan, as Joseph was, or we can be unfaithful in God's plan as Ahaz was, but in either case, this life is not heaven. We are traveling as pilgrims through this valley on our way, going somewhere. So there is this contrast between Joseph and his embrace of providence and Ahaz and his rejection of providence. And you know, we should have a sharp stick of conscience poking us when we're not following God's will because following God's will is difficult. And let me hear it. I'm here to tell you, you expect life to be fair in God's providence? I'm telling you, it's not. It's not. I wish I could explain that away, but I can't. I can only tell you that it is through the cross that we come to understand the providence of God. Doing the right thing is oftentimes much harder than doing the wrong thing. But we are called with Joseph to do the right thing in God's providence and reject Ahaz and all evil to do the will of God and let his perfect providence control our life. That's what Joseph did. And he is the model of our faith. You know, we live in a fallen world and we face horrible evil. And do we face it embracing the providence of God and living a life of faith? Or do we do what Ahaz did and join the evil ones because it seems like their power is stronger? My brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a contrast between Joseph and Ahaz today. May we follow the model of Joseph.